Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good morning, everyone. It is Sunday, January the 16th, 2022. It is currently 9.48 a.m. Central Time, and I'm coming to you live from the empty sanctuary of Victory Baptist Church, located right here in Ovalo, Texas. And yes, unfortunately, the sanctuary is empty because of some COVID situations here with the church. So technically, yes, I'm supposed to be waiting for people to show up here at the building and get ready for the Sunday school hour. And I, usually I would be just pacing back and forth, keep looking out the window going, okay, is anyone going to show up today? Is anyone going to show up today? And then wait for people to show up. And then we would begin the Sunday school hour and we probably would be going in a completely different direction this morning. But even though today is Sunday, so technically what I'm supposed to be doing today is starting a new week for our Bible study exercise, introducing to you our, our Bible study exercise For this new week, that's what I'm supposed to be doing. I I can't, I can't, I just, I can't move on yet. We still need to work on the book of Obadiah, which was last week's Bible study exercise. We did a lot of work in it. I thought we, I thought we started off really strong. I think our overviews was, was, I think we did a very good job with our overview, our outlining. I think I got us Really, I think I got us off to a good start. A lot of good assignments and homework that I gave people. And a lot of people did work on the homework and assignments. And and we had lots of, of interesting discussions about Obadiah. And then we took kind of an interesting detour that I was hoping was going to spark a lot of conversation, but it did not. We turned to the Bible study curriculum for Obadiah which had a very interesting approach, which really raised the question, as a Christian, what is your responsibility in dealing with the injustices found in the culture and in the world? What what are you to do when you see things that are unjust, when you see things that are not just? What is your responsibility as a Christian? Now, they used Obadiah to try to get to that discussion I don't know if they really provided us any good answers. I did not. I, we we worked through the curriculum and then we stopped because we ran out of time. But I'm not I'm not going to turn back to that today. I, there's a part of me that says, well, there's a there's just a little bit left. But I'm just going to leave that for you to go read the curriculum and work on. I think I think it's a question that every Christian has to ask themselves when when there's injustice. What do you do? What, what is your responsibility as a believer? What's the responsibility of the church in dealing with things in our culture when, when, when things are not being done right? It raises lots of questions, and I don't know if Obadiah is the best answer. I think we would have to consider what the New Testament says, but, but I leave that for you to work on. But I, I, I still felt like even after we've done all of that, we can't be done with Obadiah yet. We we can't be. We can't be. So let's do this. First, let's remind ourselves of this. Obadiah chapter one, or when I say chapter one, Obadiah verse one, not really chapters. Obadiah verse one, the vision of Obadiah. Thus saith the Lord God concerning Edom. We have heard a rumor from the Lord And an ambassador is sent among the heathen, arise ye and let us rise up against her in battle. That was the memory verse for last, well, I would say last week for our Bible study exercise. For all of you using the Bible memory app, hopefully you you reviewed it. Hopefully you, you, you memorized it. And don't forget Micah 5, 2 was the previous memory verse. So try to review that and work on that. I, I, in fact, I just got a notification on the Bible memory app that it's time for me to do review work on my Bible memory verses. But I don't have time, obviously, to do that right now. But yes, I just got that notification on my iPad. Hey, you need to be doing a review. I, I, I can't right now. I can't. Sorry, Bible memory app. I can't do a review. But hopefully you are doing that and you have it memorized. The reason we, the reason, I should say, the reason I... <laughs> I don't think it I don't think everyone else agreed with me, but the reason I chose verse one is I think it really kind of summarizes what Obadiah is, right? I think it really summarizes what this book is all about. 
It is a vision of Obadiah that gives us God's word concerning Edom. And I think that's a great reason to memorize it because it will all, if you memorize the verse, anytime anyone says, well, what, what's, what's the book of Obadiah about? Oh, well, it's a vision containing God's word about Edom. I mean, like that's, that's easy for you to remember. Um, and, I, and I think that will be beneficial. And that doesn't ex- answer all the questions we have about the book of Obadiah, but it helps us at least remember what it is about. So you may be thinking, okay, this is like part seven on Obadiah. We've done overview. We've done outline. We, we even spent a, a, an over an hour working on the phrase day of the Lord, which is found in Obadiah chapter one or chapter one, Obadiah verse 15. I keep wanting to say chapter one, Obadiah verse 15. Now we talked about what that, what does that phrase even mean? What does it mean and how do we understand it? And we did a little bit of work of different things associated with the concept, the day of the Lord. And I I hope that was beneficial. So you may be asking, so what can we do today? I mean, really, is there is there anything else we can do? (laughs) Oh, you always know there's things to do. So here's what I I hope this is going to prove to be beneficial and interesting and fun. And uh, we'll see. It's going to take a lot a lot of work to finish this, but I'm going to do my very best to see how close we can finish it this morning. I may have to come back and finish it this afternoon. But are you ready? Here's what we're going to do. What was it? Two years ago, maybe a year ago. I can't remember. It was probably two years ago. I received permission from the ministry through the Bible, Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, obviously he passed away, but his ministry continues his through the Bible ministry. And if you're not familiar with Dr. J. Vernon McGee, he had a ministry where every five, he basically, it was a five-year journey through the Bible right? He would start in Genesis and then for the next five years, work all the way through the Bible. And then at the end of that, the net, he would start over and go through the Bible again, right? It was a, an awesome ministry. There's really not been any other ministry exactly like his. And uh, it was very, very well-known ministry. And it was a radio ministry, very well-known, very famous. And the way it worked is Monday through Friday, they would go through basically verse by verse teaching through the Bible. On Saturdays, they did questions and answers. And then on Sundays, there would be the Sunday sermon based off whatever book that he was teaching. It was just like a seven day a week Bible education for anyone who would listen to the radio program. Well, obviously, after Dr. J. Vernon McGee passed away, the ministry transitioned over to a more internet based ministry, podcast based ministry. And it's still available today. You can subscribe to the podcast or you can just go to the, the Through the Bible website. Let me see if I can find the uh, the website address for you. I think it's uh, ttb.org. Let me see, ttb.org. I'm almost positive. Yes, ttb, that's T-T-B. Dot O-R-G, and there you can get his notes and outlines. You, I mean, you get everything. It's all available to you, and they make it all available for free. All right, so absolutely, and you can subscribe to the Through the Bible uh, podcast. It's just, I, I really respect everything they've done. Uh, they, I, I remember way back before the internet became, you know, obviously the dominant way in which we uh, get media, you could just write to through the Bible and they would send you the notes and outlines. They would send you the notes and outlines as well for the book that they were currently working through. So the reason I mention them is a couple of years ago, I received permission from through the Bible that I could use their content any way that I want. I could just literally like, I can just turn on I can grab one of their sermons, one of the teachings and just play it. I don't, in other words, I don't have to use it for like critique, analysis, review. I can just literally just play it for you. And that's awesome. They gave me the permission and, and I mean, I don't have to do anything other than just say it's from through the Bible ministries. So it's really gracious that they were willing to give me that kind of permission. But here's what we're going to do. I found the teaching that Dr. J. Vernon McGee d- did on the book of Obadiah. So now I'm not just going to play it for you. No, 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 no. That wouldn't be any fun. I am going, we're going to work through it like, not even, kind of like a review, kind of like a sermon review, but not so much to critique. Well, we'll, we'll probably do some critique as well, obviously. We're just going to work through it together. And this will add a different perspective on Obadiah. 
uh, Dr. J. Vernon McGee's educational background, I think will give give us some will will allow us to maybe hear different perspectives on it. I think he was taught one perspective and then kind of changed his perspective later on. And I think this will add uh, just a whole new dimension to our study in Obadiah. And really just, I want to make sure that we, I, I don't want to move on until I'm sure that we have done everything we can to make sure that we all understand Obadiah to the best of our ability. All right. Now, some people love Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Some people hate his accent and his voice. Try to set aside those personal preferences and let's just focus on the book of Obadiah. Now, what, they, what they've done is I, they, they've given me the MP3 file and it removes all of the radio intro, the music. It, it removes all of that. And so it's just all together. Now, sometimes it's weird. There's like a little break. And that's, that's where like one bro- radio broadcast would end and then it just comes in with the next one, but you don't have the intro or the review. So it t- sometimes it may feel like it jumps, but I think it should all make sense. The file they gave me was one hour and 37 minutes long. That's a long file because you know how long it takes for us to work through this. So you know we're not going to finish this during this hour. You know, you, you know, you know it's impossible, right? It's one of the reasons I started early, okay? But we'll go all the way to 11 a.m. I was going to say 11 p.m. We're going to go all the way to 11 p.m. We're going to go to 11 a, to 11 a.m. And then we'll stop, take about a five-minute break, and then come back in and then go to at least maybe 12, 10, 12, 15, and see if we can finish all of this. As always, the live chat is open. So if you have a thought, observation, or question, I know you're going to be like, well, that could, <laughs> that could cause us to, to, to go down some path that, that derails everything. It could, but I'm willing to, to take derail everything and stop everything to make sure that everyone has a correct understanding of the book of Obadiah. All right. So I'm, I'm going to, before we move on to the next, because the next Bible study is Genesis 37. That's where we're going to be. And we're going to be talking about generational sins and so many different issues. So before we introduce that this afternoon, let's finish the book of Obadiah. Let's finish this Bible study exercise as strong as we can so that everyone knows the book of Obadiah. Are you ready? He's getting, remember, when I hit play, it's just going to jump right in. There's no music. There's no intro. All of that's been removed. It's just the teaching he did. I don't know how many episodes it took on his radio program to make it through Obadiah. Uh, it probably took uh, a couple. Um, and we're going to try to put this all together right now. Um, I have, uh, just to tell you what I have here next to me, I have the ultimate Bible guide right here in front of me. I have the Bible dictionary. I have uh, a commentary on uh, Obadiah, and I have a study guide on Obadiah. Um, not the, stu- the Bible study curriculum study guide, since it, since it went more about talking about our responsibility to deal with injustices. Um, but I've got these all available, and at any point we may reference them and break in and see. His outline, interesting enough, for those who are actually participating in the Bible study exercises, someone sent me an outline, and I think they even referenced, this is how J. Vernon McGee handled it. And so we're going to hear his outline where he really kind of breaks it into two parts. It, it kinda, it's kind of like judgment on Edom. And then this is very, very important. Restoration of Israel. Restoration of Israel, which is a very important biblical concept that either you say is true and literal or you say is not true and literal, and it only references the church. And I think once you start going with the non-literal thing, and again, I've got to stress this. I know we've talked about it all week. You can't, it makes no sense to me to say the judgment of Edom was literal, but the restoration of Israel is figurative or spiritual. Like who, where did you go to school and learn that hermeneutic, right? Hey, the judgment on Edom, boom, literal, Restoration of Israel, not so literal. It, 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 that, I don't, and, and all in the same book, all in the, really the same chapter. It just, that, that's what we've really been trying to go after. And I've been trying to correct that a lot uh, because I think we have to deal with that. But let's see what he actually does, what he actually has to say. 
It's now 10.03, so we have no time to waste. Here we go. Notebooks open, Bibles open, thinking caps on, and uh, we'll we'll see. I, I don't know how many people will be participating in the live chat, but I may try to stop and ask questions and see if we can get some participation going that way to just uh, add another dimension to our, well, bringing this study of Obadiah to hopefully a very profitable conclusion. Here we go. Now, friends, we come to a little book with a great message. This is an example of the atom bomb in the Bible because it's such a small thing and it has such a potent message. Now, Obadiah is one of the prophets that we know absolutely nothing about. We only know that he wrote this prophecy. Now, there are actually four prophets that are cloaked in anonymity. We don't know anything about them. The other three would be Habakkuk, Haggai, and Malachi. Now, Now, stop right here. So there's four prophets that we don't know anything about. Obadiah, Habakkuk, Haggai, and Malachi. All right. I think that that's that's important. We just don't know anything about them. Now, that sometimes that can cause, well, we we could go into a whole discussion about that. We won't go go into that. Just so that you know that. It's something to know. These are people we don't know anything about. And therefore, we don't. That, that lack of information either creates no problem or creates problems in interpreting their respective prophecies. You, you can draw your own conclusion there. All right, let's continue. Obadiah is like a ghost writer. He's there, but we do not know him. He lived up to his name, by the way, for his name means servant of Jehovah. You see, a servant boasts of no genealogy. He doesn't put himself forward. He has to demonstrate by what he does that he can even claim the place of a servant. And actually, what you have in Obadiah is that which is very much like the gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark presents the Lord Jesus Christ as the servant of Jehovah. That character of our Lord is there. And in the Gospel of Mark, there's no genealogy because we don't need that for a servant. And in the Gospel of Mark, it's the Gospel of action. The question is, is he able to do what he claims that he can do? And so Obadiah is just a prophet who wrote one of the great prophecies of the Scripture. Now, the great... Now, we can get into a practical thing here, uh, that Obadiah is the servant of Jehovah. There's no genealogy. He kind of serves as a ghostwriter. We don't really know anything about him. So, it's it, in other words, he's serving Jehovah in a way that doesn't draw attention to him, but he serves Jehovah and putting forth God's message. In other words, for all of us as Christians and serving God, it never needs to be about us. It always needs to be about God's message. Once it becomes about us, then that all kinds of problems usually ensue, right? It, it, it should never be about us. Remember, the whole Christian life is deny self, die to self, and not follow self. When it becomes about us, That's a major problem. I just did a podcast episode, I think yesterday, in regards to how many Christians have handled the pandemic. We've made it about us. We've made it about us, 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 our rights, our rights, what we're going to do, what I think, what I feel, instead of going, how can we serve? How can we serve? How can we serve? It's not like, how can we serve? What about us? What about our rights? And uh, Obadiah, in a sense, is like, it's not about him. He's there, but he's not really there. We don't know anything about him. It's not about his family lineage. It's not about anything. It's not about, it's just, here's this servant who's going to give us God's word. And and that's a lesson for all of us in a practical way. All right. Difficulty with Obadiah has always been where to date it. Where does it fit in? 
to the history of the nation Israel. And very candid. Okay, here we go. The dating. Where does this fit in with the nation of Israel? How does this fit in? We've had so many discussions this week about this. People doing all of their homework and assignments, trying to figure this out. We, there's so much speculation and a lot of it hinges on one verse. And do we understand the verse in a historical way or a prophetic way? But we'll, we'll see what Dr. J. Vernon McGee's doing. What, what is he going to offer up as a date? Now, I have, I know where he's going to go because I'm currently looking um, right here in front of me at the, the uh, notes and outlines from Dr. J. Vernon McGee. And he has an entire paragraph here on dating it. And he's, I, I, I'm assuming that nothing has changed from when he aired this. And I don't know, this is probably the 1970s, maybe, maybe the 80s, um, when, when this possibly aired. Who knows? But um, it'll be interesting. To see. I don't think anything changed from the writing of the outlines because I think these are, I don't think they've updated them in any way, shape, or form. So it'd probably be very similar. But we'll, if there's any difference here, I'll give you, we can't go into everything about the dating, but we'll just at least hear this, okay? Because we've had lots of discussions this week about this. But let's, uh, let's just see what we can learn right now. Let there's a great deal of difficulty at this particular point. There are some who give the date as early as 887 B.C., and that would fix the time during the reign of the bloody Athaliah. You find that record over in 2 Kings, the 8th chapter, verses 16 through 26, which we'll not turn to. Dr. Pusey. Now, Stop right here. So this would be, some would give it the date of 887, 887 BC. All right. Uh, so I, I don't know if we, I don't know if there was a lot of uh, discussion about that day, but 887 BC, right? But someone else is going to put it at a different date. Listen. Uh, it's placed it during the reign of Jehoshaphat. You find that in Second Chronicles 17.7. And by the way, he also made this statement concerning Obadiah. God is will, that is, name alone, and his brief prophecy should be known to the world. Now, actually, his name was as common in that day as the name John is today. And because you find it mentioned in Second Chronicles 17.7 would not mean that that Obadiah is the one that we have here. And Canon Farah, he gave the date as 587 B.C., and Dr. Moorhead concurred in this as he suggested that Obadiah was probably a contemporary with Jeremiah. All right, so... We have the date 887 B.C. or 587 B.C. 887 or 587. That's a, that's, a, that's a big difference. Now, how significant is this in the dating? I think it really comes down to, to me, what we all, the only thing we really need to figure out is, okay, when this judgment came upon Edom, when did it occur and when was it completed? Like, when was the judgment upon Edom? To me, that is the most important thing. And I know some of this I'm just speaking as if you're already, you know what I'm already talking about because we've been discussing this all week. So if you haven't been participating in the Bible study exercise and you're a little confused, just, that's fine. Just write down possibly 887 B.C., or 587 BC. And I, I don't have time to now to re go through all of the discussion about dating. But let's see what else Dr. J. Vernon McGee has to say in regards to the dating and some of other issues here. And the whole question seems to hinge on verse 11. And verse 11 reads like this In the day that thou stoodest on the other side, in the day that the strangers carried away captive his forces and foreigners entered into his gates, cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou wast as one of them. That would mean here that either this is historical or prophetic. 
And the natural interpretation, of course, is to accept the historical one, and that would give us the late date. Most likely, it was written subsequent to the Babylonian captivity. It was written in that particular time around the time of Jeremiah, by the way. And the early dating, as far as I'm concerned, is out. Now, he's going to discuss actually the little... Okay. Now, this... Dr. J. Vernon McGee feels like that it was written subsequent to the Babylonian captivity. And if it was written subsequent to the Babylonian captivity, that would, that would r- rule out 887 B.C. That would have to put it in the 587 period. So that, that, and the reason, if you don't understand, Obadiah 1 or Obadiah 11 reads like this. Let me read it to you one more time. In the day that thou stoodest on the other side, in the day that the stranger carried away Captive his forces and foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem. Even thou was as one of them. This is saying, this is writing about what Edom did when the Babylonian captivity occurred. They stood and watched. They, they were like the cap, they, they were like the, like the Babylonians in the sense that they didn't do anything to stop it. They just watched it happen. Well, that would mean that this would be written, have to be written after the fact. Some try to try to say, no, that's that's prophetic. It's saying what would happen when the Babylonians came. But the natural reading seems to be, no, this would be describing it after it occurred. All right. So that would give us around the 587 date. So there you have it. Just just and I think that makes some sense. And it's just interesting that uh, really a lot of it hinges on verse 11. All right, let's continue kingdom of Edom. And the key to this entire little book is Obadiah verse 6. How are the things of Esau searched out? How are his hidden things sought out? Now, he believes verse 6 is the key verse. I believe verse 1 is the key verse because I believe verse 1 does explain to us it's about Edom and that it's God's word. So I, I believe that verse one gives us the author, gives us what it is, gives us what it's about. I think verse one, everyone wants so many books said verse six, but it's just how are the things of Esau searched out? How are his hidden things sought out? How is, I don't know how that's the key verse. I, I, I don't get verse one is the key. If the verse one gives us everything we need to know, how is it verse six? How, why, why are you saying, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, why do you think it's verse six? It just seems like every book goes with that. I, I, I don't understand that. It makes no sense to me. Sometimes it's like, sometimes it feels like, okay, I'm going to teach this book, right? This, this is what it feels like. And this is what you have to avoid. Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to study this book or I'm going to teach this book. And so what pastors do, they grab a book. I'm like, oh, so the key verse, this is what they say the key verse is. So they just write it in their sermon. That's the key verse. And then everyone just keeps saying the same thing. Year, sermon after sermon, year after year, everyone just keeps following the same mi- mindset. At some point, someone's got to raise their hand and go, well, wait a minute. Are we sure that's the key verse? Why is that the key verse? Just because 50 commentaries have said it doesn't mean every pastor has to copy it, right? Can we do a little bit of work and challenge it? I think verse one gives us everything we need. It gives us the key and understanding of the book. So I'm going to stay with verse one. I know. I know. I, I'm, I'm just, dis, you're going to say, you're just disagreeing to disagree. Maybe, but I don't think so. All right, here we go. And the outline that I have of the book is this. You have in the first 16 verses, and there's only one chapter And so that would be chapter one, if you want to identify it like that. The subject is Edom and is destruction. And you have the charge against Edom, crime of Edom, and the catastrophe that came to Edom. And then you... All right. Now, his outline, and I'm not going to go back and review the outline I gave you. His outline is verses one through 16... Edom, 
destruction. Now, the way he teaches, of course, because he's on radio, so he he didn't have time to just like go over and review the outline and you just had to move through it. Just He had to just move through it where I can take as much time with outlines and re- and even when I preach though, I repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat the outline because I'm doing that because I'm trying to tell you, write it down, okay? I'm, tell- I'm trying to tell you to write it down. All right, but here we go. Here's his outline. I'm going to I'm going to slow it down so that we can at least you can consider his outline and how wrong it is compared to mine. I'm joking, I'm joking, right? Here we go. His outline, verses 1 through 16. And and he basically breaks the book down into two parts. So the first part or number 1, Edom destruction verses 1 through 16. And then he has three subpoints. A, charge against Edom verses 1 through 9. B, crime of Edom, verses 10 through 14. C, catastrophe to Edom, verses 15 through 16. All right? And uh, he calls this poetic justice or law of retaliation. All right? So verses 1 through 16, this is number one, Edom, destruction, three subpoints, charge against Edom, verses 1 through 9, crime of Edom, verses 10 through 14, catastrophe to Edom, verses 15 through 16, which he refers to as poetic justice or law of retaliation, right? Then number two is Israel restoration, verses 17 through 21, and then three subpoints. A, condition of Israel, verse 17. B, calling of Israel, verse 18. And then C, consummation of all things, Verses 19 through 21, and the key there is the kingdom shall be the Lord's. So that is uh, J. Vernon McGee's outline. Edom, or uh, number one, Edom, destruction, verses 1 through 16, three subpoints, charge against Edom, verses 1 through 9, crime of Edom, verses 10 through 14, catastrophe to Edom, verses 15 through 16. He refers to that as poetic justice or law of retaliation. Retaliation. Number two, Israel restoration, verses 17 through 21, three subpoints, condition of Israel, verse 17, calling of Israel, verse 18, C, consummation of all things, verses 19 through 21, and he refer, refers to that as the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Now, again, let me stress this again. If the destruction of Edom is literal, Edom is literal, the destruction is literal, then how do you come along and say the restoration of Israel is not literal Israel? And it's not literal restoration of the nation. It's the church. I, that is some just horrible hermeneutics. Horrible hermeneutics. Right, let's, let's now let him finish the second part of his outline. You have in verses 17 to 21, Israel, and that's restoration. Condition of Israel, verse 17. Calling of Israel, verse 18. And consummation of all things, in verses 19 through 21. Now, that gives you very briefly an outline of this book. Now, this opens with the vision of Obadiah. And I should read the entire first verse. The vision of Obadiah. Thus saith the Lord God concerning Edom. We've heard a rumor from the Lord And an ambassador is sent among the heathen, that is, the Gentiles, the nations. Arise ye, and let us rise up against her in battle. Now, this is the vision of Obadiah. And again, somebody is going to say, well, who's Obadiah? Well, I don't know. And I hope you won't let that word get out, because... There's some people here in Southern California that think I know. I don't know. And the very interesting thing is that though I've read quite a few books on Obadiah, I never found anybody that did know who he is. So I don't mind joining that illustrious group of those who do not know who Obadiah is. And I just have to answer that very truly. Now, his name, as we've indicated, was a very common name in Israel. It's rather like Abdullah is among the Arabs today. And by the way, Abdullah means servant of God. So Obadiah and Abdullah, 
to names that are common among those people over there, but this Obadiah we know nothing about. And we have here a book that a great many people feel like it's, you know, something that's not worth even fooling with. If it even dropped out of the Bible, you wouldn't lose very much. And I frankly think you'd lose a great deal. It seems to deal with that which is past largely, yet in it is a great message for us today. And what you have here is not that which is cold ashes, but you have here spewing hot lava, and it has a message for you and me today. And Obadiah tells us immediately, bluntly and to the point here, he begins, as we have seen the vision of Obadiah, but right away he says, Thus saith the Lord God concerning Edom. And we now are going to ask another question. Who's Edom? Who are we talking about? Well, we find down in verse 6 that we gave you a moment ago as a key verse. It reads, and I'll read it again, How are the things of Esau searched out? How are his hidden things sought out? Now, I consider that, I believe, is the key to the book. And if we're going to find out now about Edom, we're going to have to go back and look at Esau. Who is Esau? Because we're told something very interesting back in the book of Genesis. In the 36th chapter, verse 1, it says, Now these are the generations of Esau. Who is Edom. And so the little nation of Edom came from Esau, just as the nation Israel came from Jacob. And now notice another statement here in Genesis 36, now verse 8 and verse 9. Thus dwell Esau in Mount Seir. Esau is Edom. Now again, And these are the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites in Mount Seir. And I'm of the opinion that when Moses wrote that, he did not know that the Spirit of God was having him emphasize that for a purpose. Because when we come to Obadiah now and also to Malachi, we want to know who Edom is. Well, Esau is Edom. They nation Edom came from Esau. Edom is Esau. The Edomites were those who were descended from Esau. And now the story of Esau and Jacob is something that's before us also. And it's quite interesting. They were twin brothers, sons of Isaac and Rebekah. They were not identical twins. Actually, they were opposite. And you go back to the 25th chapter of Genesis now, and let me just reach in and lift out a few verses there. Verses 22 and 23. It says, And the children struggle together within her. In other words, what we have here is that Rebecca is going to give birth to twins. Now listen, I'm reading. If it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be born of thee. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. Now these two individuals, one struggling against the other. That, first of all, was something that took place. In actual life, we find that these two boys, twins, one of them was an outdoor boy, outgoing fella. That was Esau, a hunter. And then this man, Jacob, he was tied to his mama's apron string. He was a mama's boy. And they were very far apart. But the very interesting thing is that Jacob had a spiritual discernment that Esau did not have. Esau was a man of the flesh. He did not care for his birthright. He was willing to sell it for a bowl of soup. And it wasn't that he was so hungry that he was about to perish 
and there wasn't anything to eat in the home of Isaac. There was plenty to eat, but he smelt the soup that this brother his had made, and he so discounted his birthright that he was willing to trade it in on a bowl of soup, which he actually didn't have to have at all. He just happened to be hungry, and it was the whim of the moment, and it was the desire of the flesh, and he is willing to trade away all of his spiritual heritage for that. And believe me, that's a picture of Christians today because this is an illustration of a great truth for you and me today. You see, a believer has two natures within him, and they are struggling against each other. Paul makes this point in the epistle to the Galatians. He says, speaking to believers now, For the flesh lusteth or wars against the spirit, and the spirit wars against the flesh. These are contrary, the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. Now, these are the two natures in the believer, the new nature and the old nature. They're opposed to each other. And Esau pictures the flesh, Jacob the spirit. And you follow the history of this boy Esau, and you read... I'm reading now from Genesis 25, verse 30. Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. Edom means red, or sunburned, actually. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I'm at the point to die. And what profit shall this birthright do to me? And Jacob said, Swear to me this day. And he swore to him, sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. That is, he didn't care. And thus Esau despised his birthright. Now, it's, now it's an interesting, and, and I don't want to go, because we could literally stop right here and just have some serious conversations about this. I find it interesting on one hand that J- Dr. J. Vernon McGee feels that Jacob and Esau illustrates the battle of two natures inside of us as Christians. I, I, I like, on one hand, you like it because you know, you're like, well, you can really preach that. But just because something preaches good, I, I'm a little hesitant. Now, there's no question the Bible refers to Esau's despising his birthright. So you could say he is fleshly, but do we really say Jacob is a great picture of the spiritual nature? I mean, is Jacob such a great spiritual? I don't, I don't know. I, I think we could, we could ask ourselves this. It was the story is the historical narrative. Let me state it this way. Is the historical narr- narrative of Jacob and Esau written to serve in any way, shape, or form? Was it ever the intention of the text, of the writing, to serve as an example of the battle of the two natures inside of us? Now, preachers can come along and say, oh, look, 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 look. They're, these, two, these two boys, and they're, they're fighting even, even in the womb, okay? They're, they're against each other, in a sense, these two nations, and they're already, you know, after one another. Well, if... And then we we impose the idea that, oh, see, this is a picture. I just I just don't know if it works. I mean, how well does that work out? I mean, you're really making Jacob like he's the picture of the spiritual side. I mean, Jacob is, I mean, come on, underhanded. I mean, scheming. I, I don't really know if that's such a good, I mean, really, is, is Jacob that much more spiritual than Esau? I I know this is this is what happens in preaching, um, and I know that in in this particular case he's not preaching. He's he's kind of just you know more like just working through the, these concepts. But I gear, I bet you at some point I would be interesting. I I have a list of all of the Sunday sermons that J. Vernon McGee preached in relation to his Bible teaching. It would be interesting if he did, or even if we didn't look in Obadiah. If I went back to Genesis on the story of of Jacob and Esau, I wonder if he handled it and is preaching that way. Hey, see, this is a picture of the two natures. And I bet you everybody was like, hey, man, oh, that's awesome. Oh, that was good, pastor. That, that, w- that preached really good. But just because it preaches good, 
does it really work? Does it really work that Jacob is this really spiritual one? And Esau, man, really fleshly. I I don't know. I don't think it really works that well. I, I really don't. Put it this way. If Jacob is a picture of the spiritual nature, then the spiritual nature isn't really that good. Okay, I will say, if Jacob is a picture of the spiritual nature, then your spiritual nature is really not much better than your fleshly nature. So you're really messed up, okay? Your spiritual nature is basically not much better than your fleshly nature. I really don't see any major distinction and spiritual qualities between Jacob and Esau, other than Esau being accused of of basically despising his birthright. Okay, you, you could throw in something there, but I mean, look at all of what Jacob does. I mean, come on. I, I don't know. I have a hard time with that. It sounds so good, right? See, this is the thing, and this is how it works. At, at, depending on where you are spiritually, like what, if I was a younger Christian or even a younger pastor, I'd be like, ooh, that's good. I can preach that. Right. And so this is what you have to learn. There's that time, there's there in your Christian life, there's an immaturity where you'll grab these things and go, ooh, that's really good. And maybe you'll, you know, you'll write out and, you know, in your notebook all of these great things. But at some point, you've got to reach a, a level of spiritual maturity where you go, wait a minute, wait a minute. That sounds good, but does it actually work theologically? Does it actually work b- 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 biblically? At some point, you've got to challenge that. And I just don't think. I just don't think it works out that well. I, I don't know. You, you you can tell me what you think, but I, I have some issues with it. All right, let's continue. We said Edom means red, red and hairy. It means sunburn. And a sunburn occurs when the skin is able to absorb all the rays of the light except the rays that make it red. And it's quite interesting to see that the sunburned man in Scripture is the man who could not absorb the light of heaven and it burned him. Friends, the light of heaven will either save you or burn you, one or the other. And you'll either absorb it or you'll be burned by it. It's always true. Now, this is the story of Esau, a man who was opposite to Jacob, who became Israel, a prince with God. Esau represents the flesh, and he became Edom. Israel represents the spirit. Now we have seen Esau in the first book of the Old Testament. Now we come now to the last book of the Old Testament and read this strange language. I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet ye say, in what way hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau. That's in Malachi 1, 2, and part of 3. Now, that's a strange statement, is it not? Now, God says in the last book of the Old Testament, I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau. And that immediately presents a problem. A student came one time to Dr. Griffith Thomas, and he said to him, Dr. Thomas, I'm having a problem with this statement in Malachi. And Dr. Thomas says, what's your problem? He said, well, I cannot understand why God says that he hates Esau. Dr. Thomas replied to the young man. He says, young man, I'm having a problem with that verse too, but my problem is different from yours. I cannot understand why he said that he loved Jacob. I can understand why he hated Esau. But I can't understand why he loved Jacob. <laughs> that's, that's, I like that. Now, see, now that, there, I, I understand that. That makes sense. So, because I think that the thing about Jacob, it wasn't that Jacob was, like, I, like that's why I have a hard time saying he pictures the, the spiritual nature. I, I think Jacob pictures those whom God chooses. I think, I think it has everything to do with God's election He chose Jacob not because Jacob was spiritual. He chose Jacob not because he was better than than Esau. He chose him because of his divine sovereign election. Israel was chosen by God not because they were better than the other nations around them, but because he so did so sovereignly. And so therefore, Israel is chosen by God and therefore will be restored even after all of their sin were Edom 
wasn't chosen, their rebellion is judged and they are condemned and destroyed, which becomes a very much a picture of how God's sovereignty works and election, which we've taught. And that's how come Jacob and Esau shows up in, uh, we talked about Romans 9. I don't, I think I kept saying Romans 8 last time, Romans 9. And, uh, it's just very interesting how that all works together. But that is funny. Hey, why does God hate Esau? That's not right. Well, wait a minute. Why did God even bother loving Jacob? Isn't that why? Oh, let's really get personal. Why does God love you? Because we deserve his hate. Now, the thing that lends importance to the little book of Obadiah, for it's the only place in the word of God where you have the explanation of why God hated Esau. And again, I turn to the key verse. How are the things of Esau searched out? How are his hidden things sought out? Now, Ginsburg, the great Hebrew scholar, translates it this way. How are the things of Esau stripped bare? In other words, in the little book of Obadiah here, there is open before us for the first time Edom or Esau. In other words, Obadiah puts a microscope down on Esau, and when you look through the eyepiece, you see Edom. Not only did Obadiah focus the microscope on him, but Obadiah is God's microscope. And you come here and and look through the microscope. Will you look? What do you see? One Esau now is magnified. And that has become a nation of 250,000 little Esau. And that's Edom. And you could take a picture to a photographer, a little miniature, and he makes an enlarged picture. He says, I blew up the picture. Well, Obadiah is the blown-up picture of Esau. You inflate a tire tube to find a tiny leak in it. You couldn't find the leak until you inflated it. Just so Obadiah presents Esau inflated so that you can see where the flaw was in his life. And you won't maybe find it back in Genesis. You can see why God said he hated Esau. You see what was at the beginning a little Now, this gets into a massive theological discussion that we've talked about in our study in Romans, and we're going to be talking about it again when we get to Romans chapter 9. Let me just remind you, though, mm, I'm, I'm not a big fan of the way he's wording this. He's like, okay, here's the reason God hated them. Here's the reason, as if God hated Esau because he looked down through time and said, see what they're going to do? Therefore, I hate them. Well, the... Well, then God could have looked through time and look at all the things Jacob was going to do and say, well, that's why I hate him. No, that, that's not the way Romans presents the information. Romans chapter 9, just so that we know this, Romans chapter 9, verse 11, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand not of works, But of him that calleth, it was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. That that decision was made in in eternity. That was based off God's sovereignty. All right, so you you could, I mean, I mean, we really could get into a discussion here. Did, did they do those things and that's the reason God hated them? That doesn't seem to be what Romans 9 implies. No, that, that would mean God didn't, like God had to look down, see what they were going to do and then make a decision based off what we're going to do. And then that's not God being sovereign and God being all knowing. That, that, that whole thing begins to fall apart. No, you could argue the difference between Jacob and Esau or Israel and Edom was God's sovereign work in them. And you could argue, was Jacob ever, was Israel ever really better than Edom? Because Israel had so many issues as well. The difference between the two is sovereignty, not works. It's sovereignty. It's election, not sovereign. It's not their works. It's God's sovereignty that's the difference. 
So I, I, I know what he's trying to say here. I do agree. Obadiah does, in a sense, blow up the picture. And you can see, here's really all of these Esau's. This is what Esau really was. This is his character and blown up in, in, in the nation of Edom. Okay, great. But let me tell you, we can go right back to Israel and blow them up and expand the picture. And guess what? We're going to see the same kind of corruption, fleshliness, rebellion, ungodliness, Oh, and this and the same. I, I think that's the, I think that's the reality of it. The difference between us and a lost person, when you really, in a sense, blow up the picture, you're going to see the same ungodly attitudes and things in us. We just may disguise it better than lost people. The reality is the difference between us and them is God's sovereign salvation. That to me is the difference. So, all right, let's continue pimple under the skin is now a raging and angry cancer. What was small in Esau is now magnified a hundred thousand times in the nation. It's interesting to note, God did not say at the beginning that he hated Esau. He had to wait until he became a nation and he could reveal the thing that caused him to hate Esau. Now, one thing we need to get firmly fixed in our mind. God did not say that when the boys were born. He did not say that when they became man and both of them really very miserably failed. One, Esau, despised his birthright. And Jacob, down underneath that crust of cleverness and crookedness, there was that desire for the things of God. And he went about getting the birthright in the wrong way, that which God had vouchsafed to him and actually gave to him in a right way. And before he could become not Jacob, but Israel, why, God had to break him. And God broke his leg in order to get him. And the man limped the rest of his life. And you find him way down in Egypt, dying, leaning on that staff that he had leaned on so many years because of the fact that God finally got that man and brought him to himself. Now, God never said that he hated Esau, nor did he say he loved Jacob. But you come now to the last book in the Old Testament, and one is a nation, a nation of several million people. And the other, likewise, was a nation. And you see now, Israel has been mightily used of God down through the centuries up to this point. And there has come in their history a man like Moses, Joshua, and Samuel, and David, and Hezekiah, and then Nehemiah and Ezra, and on down the line. But Esau, the nation that came from him, became a godless nation and turned their backs upon God. But what was it that caused God to hate him and to hate the nation? Now, when you put something under the microscope, it's enlarged. And instead of having one man, you have a nation now, and Esau has been enlarged into a great nation. And you begin to see the defect. You begin to see that thing that is the real problem. I know that when I had cancer, they took some of the infected part and they put it under the microscope. And you couldn't see it just looking at it. But putting it under the microscope, they told me what they could see. Well, we have here now a look at this man, Esau, and Esau is Edom. That was repeated about three times back in the book of Genesis. Now we are looking at Edom, but we see Esau, and we see this great nation. Now, what was the sin? Well, let me read now. Verse 2, he says, Behold, I have made thee small among the nations. 
thou art greatly despised. Now, this great people, because they were a great people, as we are going to see in just a few moments, but they now have been brought down, are going to be brought down. This, I think, is a prophecy that looks to the future. And where we stand today, it's been fulfilled. Now, I want to look at that. What was it? Well, I read verse 3 now. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee, thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? Now, let me stop right here. Now, there are just a couple of things. I want to just make sure we stress this. He, he keeps acting like, well, God had never said that he hated them until basically they became a nation. Let me make it very clear. Romans 9 says that he loved and hated them, and this ha- was before the children were even born. So let, let's not forget Romans 9 and all of this, okay? So I, 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 he could— J. Vernon McGee is almost forcing me to go in a direction I don't want to go, but we'll, we'll definitely pick up these concepts when we get to Romans 9 and really dig into them because it's almost like trying to get, you know, look, I, you know, hey, look, look, this is the reason they hate. I, I, would, I would just challenge you, compare everything Edom did to everything Israel did and, and compare all of the, the privileges and benefits Israel had compared to what Edom had. Therefore, that would even increase the guilt and responsibility of Israel. They had God in their midst. They had the Ten Commandments. They had priests. They had, they had, they had everything. They had prophets. They had everything. And look what they do over and over and over. And look what Edom did. I mean, really, are, are you going to say, well, Edom was so bad, God had to hate him, but Israel was so good that God loved them. You're leading it almost into a works-based concept. It's because of God's election. Edom is punished because of what they do to Israel, God's chosen people. That's what happens. Now, we're, we're almost out of time, but I, I, we should have done this this week, and I met it myself. We may have to add another kind of special study here, but I want you to just write this phrase down, all right? I want you to just write this phrase down, and we're going to have to stop it right there, and I don't really want to stop it right here. Well, actually, we'll, we'll, we'll probably take it just a little further, and then we'll stop, but I, I want you to just, if you don't get anything else from this hour of teaching, I want you to write this down. We've, we've got now, we've got dating, we've got outlines, we've got history, we, we, we're just really reinforcing everything we've talked about this week. We've really not found anything that we haven't already discussed, but I want to give you one extra thing here, right? Here we go. I want you to write down this phrase if you if you have a notebook open this morning. And if you don't, just remember this phrase. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. I want you to think about, meditate on how pride deceives you. How, how have you been deceived in the past by your own pride? How are you being deceived right now by your own pride? And how can you avoid in the future from becoming deceived by your own pride? How has pride deceived you in the past? How could it be deceiving you now? And how can we avoid the deception of pride in the future? How does it deceive you? I want you to really try to articulate, if you can, in writing, what does it mean to be deceived by your pride? Like, how does, how does pride come along and deceive you? How? How? Now, in their case, and, and in Adam's case, we see their pride deceives them in thinking that they're invincible, that no one can defeat them. They think they cannot fall. That's where their pride takes them down. How has pride taken you? How has pride deceived you? That is a very powerful phrase that I would almost want that to be the memory verse. But for the purpose of our study of Obadiah, verse one needed to be the memory verse. But verse three, to me, Verse three, the pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. That's like, I mean, wow, that, that's the phrase that needs to be written down. That's the phrase that needs to be memorized. 
uh, just from a practical standpoint. But let, let's see if we can take this, we'll see if we can find a good stopping point, and then we'll be ready to go for the next hour. Here we go. Now, what was it that God said here that he hated them for? What was pride? Now, I'm sure that the minute that I say that, that it's taken the wind out of the sails of many listeners. And they're going to say, is that all? Why, may I say that I don't quite understand that. Pride is bad, but it's not that bad, is it? Well, let me show you how we have things all out of proportion today. Suppose I told you that there was a certain Christian that I knew that was drinking very heavy. And I would like to ask your advice of what the church should do with him that he belongs to. Now, I'm sure that many of you would say he ought to be put out of the membership of the church. And if you said that, I would agree with you. Now, suppose I'd say to you that an officer of a certain church was caught the other night in a supermarket by the police, and he was breaking into the safe. He's a thief. And I say to you, what do you think the church that he belongs to ought to do with him? You'd say, well, I'm sure that he ought to be put out of the church. He ought to be disciplined. And if you said that, I'd agree with you on that. Now, suppose, though, that I told you that I knew a member of a certain church and he was filled with pride, one of the proudest persons that I'd ever met. And I'd ask you, what do you think the church ought to do with him? Now, I dare say that none of you would suggest that he be put out of the church. I think many of you that have a very tender heart, many of you do, would say, well, I think maybe the pastor ought to talk to him or somebody ought to talk with him about that, that it's wrong to have pride, but that it's not such a bad sin after all, and it's one that doesn't show at least. It's not like getting drunk. It's not like stealing. It's not like lying. Would I surprise you if I told you that in the sight of God that pride is a lot worse sin than getting drunk? And the Bible has a great deal to say about drunkenness. And I have been giving in the past few weeks a great deal in that particular field, not only of the condition today, but that which brought down the nation Israel. God said that because of their drunkenness, that's the thing that brought Babylon down. It destroyed Alexander the Great. It brought Rome down and all of the great nations. It'll bring our nation down. But may I say to you that in God's sight, pride is worse than that. Now, this now we'll stop right there. That, that's a powerful point. I think the church throughout history have demonstrated that we arbitrarily say, that's the sin, that, that's it. That sin ends you, that sin destroys you, that sin causes you to be crucified. And then there's other sins where we're like, well, you know, not, not so bad. There are, there are no, forget socially acceptable, there are Christian acceptable sins and there are Christian unacceptable sins. We create the list, we create the punishments, and we uh, uh, create what we believe the consequences should be. And it's arbitrary, just based off what, here, God's like, I hate pride. And you're like, well, okay, we're not going to excommunicate anyone over pride. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, that's it over there, that's it, the end. Drag them in, scarlet letter, burn them at the stake, kill the heathen. And it's like, why Why do we do that? Why? Because we view things from our perspective instead of God's perspective. Now, it doesn't mean 
We, because here's what we have a tendency to do. Well, I didn't commit the sin of pride and everyone, no one cares about pride. So you need to stop looking at how bad my sin was because at least it wasn't pride. I'm not saying we do that. I'm saying that what we need to do is realize that there's a lot of sins that are really serious that we have a tendency to look down on and yet we treat others as we need to have an entire meeting. We've got to do this. We got to do that. And it's like, whoa, wait, wait, why, why are we such unbalanced in this? I think we realize, I think what we have to realize is that I, I don't care who the person is, the person sitting in the church that everyone thinks is so wonderful and so great because they haven't committed that bad sin that's on our list. They can still be guilty of some very serious sins in the sight of God because God hates things like pride that for some reason gets a pass. So I think it's very important that he brings this up. Just remember, well, just remember, I think I think we can find pride in Israel as well. So it's not fair to say, well, the only reason God hated Edom is because, or Esau, because, and, and, and the Edomites, because of pride, because Israel had pride plenty of times as well. So I, I think, I think this goes to God's sovereignty that, that J. Vernon McGee is overlooking here. All right, we'll stop right there. Um, we're going to stop at the 26 minute mark. We got a long ways to go. I don't think we're going to be able to finish it in the next hour, but we'll see how far we can go. All right. If anyone has any questions, no one said anything in the live chat. So, um, I'm assuming whatever, I don't know what to assume from that, but I'll just won't assume anything. All right. Uh, but if you do have any questions, you can email me newsif at yahoo.com newsif at yahoo.com. All right. We'll stop right there. We'll be back shortly. God bless.